The plan was to ski further than any human being at any time in history within one of planet Earth's polar regions, and without any physical assistance from the outside world, no resupplies, and doing the physical work ourselves, something many in this strange business have labelled fully unsupported. With some pitifully low-resolution original video footage, slightly higher-resolution photos and graphics, TV stuff and some relevant filler footage, and seductively nostalgic peeks at original equipment I've held onto in glorious 4K, I want to offer up a sense of why we did it, how we did it, and then shamelessly suggest that you buy the book about it. Wanting to ski in a straight line, hauling two and a half times your own body weight behind you for approaching four months is, I grant you, a niche activity. People have been trying to get from point A to point B across the most extreme Arctic and Antarctic ends of our world, while staying alive, for hundreds of years. It's driven science, technology, literature, national territorial ambitions, and of course launched and sustained careers of at least some of those involved. Others, it killed. My expedition route was never originally intended for the Greenlandic ice sheet. My initial ambition was to travel across the only lump of ice on the planet that's larger, the Antarctic ice sheet. I had to transplant the whole project to the Northern Hemisphere after a funding disaster, some excruciating TV news interviews. Hi Alex, how old are you by the way? Uh, I'm 21 years old. Jolly good. And as I was determined not to end up without an expedition to show for the vast amount of planning and preparation. Aged, yes, 21. Uh, I'm 21 years old. Jolly good. I also had to re-recruit a team, as the change of timings from austral summer to boreal spring and summer meant people became unavailable. I didn't need many, perhaps just one person able to haul a sledge for weeks and weeks, not get either of us killed, and also able to get on with even when inevitable pressure mounted. I'm not a soloist. It requires a very different motivation and mindset, and besides, you can't get a permit to travel on the ice sheet on your own. So George offered to accompany. He was an accomplished athlete, but at the time all the glacier experience was on my side of the partnership, and even that amounted to only a couple of seasons. We packed, freighted the two huge sledges to our start point, and set off as we would for any other foreign mini-break. Iceland was a stopping off point en route to the east coast, where we exchanged a large jet for a smaller propeller-driven aeroplane. Looking back, against the context of the extraordinarily multifaceted projects I've worked on in the time since, I scanned through some of the old documents with no small amount of longing, also the ease of insurance. Yes, that's full cover for four months including search and rescue, on the ice sheet, including the late winter season, for barely over £300. Anyone who arranges remote location insurance these days will find that hilarious through gritted, grinding teeth. We were on a shoestring budget, albeit with a handful of generous equipment partners, so an indulgent media budget was out. With the assistance of some local friends, though, I did manage some TV time, complete with the somewhat well-fed shape I adopted prior to the journey. Over the past few years, polar travel has become very slightly stagnant. There have been a lot of trips which have just been repeats of what people have done before. And I think, well, isn't it time to do something new, something exciting? Alex and his teammate are hoping to set off from Kulusuk in Greenland over the Easter weekend and trek to the west coast and back. This is twice the length of previous expeditions at one of the coldest times of the year. We're looking to cover really, really enormous distances every day to actually get through the expedition uh, before our rations run out. So there's not going to be much time for anything apart from really 10 hours of hauling a day and then two hours at the end of each day to do admin and then sleep, really. Alex, I suppose the obvious question is why? Well, it's, it's a very, very difficult question, I guess. Um, the environment itself is absolutely spectacular and over the last few years there have been some great polar trips. But I thought it was time to do something new, something less classic, and this trip is that. So what are the danger points for you? Well, obviously the conditions out there in the spring are very, very uh, aggressive at this time of year. Um, the majority of polar expeditions actually happen during the summer months. And so we'll be having heavy winds and very, very cold temperatures. On top of that, on both coastal regions, there's a significant polar bear population. And it must be an awful lot of work to organise all this and do all the training as well. It is, because it's a fully independent expedition. Uh, as the expedition leader, I've had to coordinate everything from logistics to funding uh, to navigation, everything. Yeah. And uh, the other thing I was going to ask was, it's obviously something a bit new. How confident are you that you're going to actually be able to do it? Well, physically, um, in terms of preparations, I'm ready, my teammates ready, and uh, ready to give it a go now.
Well, I think you're leaving the country at the right time. That's right. Anyway, we've got the weather forecast coming up in just a minute, but good luck, best of luck to Thank you. Thank you. Anyhow, to the route. We had to limit the distance our helicopter drop-off and pick-up would have to fly, purely for reasons of cost. We needed a certain distance, and we didn't want to copy the quote-unquote normal route across the far south of the ice sheet. So this is what I chose, an arbitrary 700-mile straight line to the northwest. There was nothing at the intersection with the coastline, but that didn't matter, as for us it wouldn't be the end, instead merely the halfway point. To set this unsupported distance record, and to do so with something of a cushion beyond the previous longest ski journey without assistance or resupply, we'd need to do the whole thing all over again, with no respite at the turnaround spot. That previous distance record, by the way, a full Arctic Ocean crossing via the North Pole by two Norwegians in the year 2000, undoubtedly one of the all-time great journeys, certainly amongst the cream of the modern era. My plan, and these are the original screen grabs we relied on entirely for our planning, was to try and quicken our pace and limit the risk of running out of time through slow progress. That meant dropping off depots of food and stove fuel for ourselves on the way out and feeding off them on the way back. Excellent in theory, perhaps also a nod to the earliest explorers, who of course lacked airborne logistics. For our launch, the only place to feasibly use as a stepping stone was an airstrip built by the Greenlandic village of Kulasuk. It's a place I'd visited for training the summer before with the previous team, albeit not at the coldest time of year. The nearby ice cap edge was a useful proving ground nonetheless. Also, it's somewhere I've frequented over the following years for filming, training and other ice cap work, but this time we planned to stay only for a couple of days, to repack and then start our journey. Indeed, funds were so short, and with a somewhat perverse logic, I decided on our behalf that we'd camp in the street instead of seeking lodging. It meant that we'd be on the way to acclimatising, mentally and physically, apparently. In practice, it meant that we ended up being the local children's entertainers for most of the day. So that was okay. Then, following a rather unorthodox attitude towards airport security... Obviously we're not allowed any dangerous or sharp objects onwards to Tassilak, which either side of a brief summer is only accessible by helicopter. Usefully, the same helicopter we'd blow most of our budget on chartering the next day to fly us to the edge of the ice and the real start of the long-haul expedition. Neither of us took dedicated video cameras. Smartphones didn't quite have proper video yet, and compact stills cameras only had video functions as an afterthought. So, while some of our photos worked out nicely, less can be said for any sporadic filming. Apologies once again. We also found ourselves busy, and as novices, without the coping headroom to think of too many things at once, let alone making a movie. Anyhow, proof that we were indeed dropped off. I pointed out to the pilot where we wanted to be set down, by the sea ice, and the calm weather offered us a gentle introduction, temperatures in the minus teens, not too much wind, and plenty of blue skies. We got into our sledging routine, 65 minutes on and 10 minutes off. Later these breaks would shorten if it was particularly cold or windy. We made the best of fleeting evening light before the early evenings drew in, shrouding us and our home in darkness. Tent routine takes a while to slicken up at the start of even a veteran's expedition. We were far from one of those just yet. Even though, tent time was civilised if you count dropping blocks of clarified butter into food pouches as civilised. We calculated we could survive the expedition with 110 days of rations, eating 5,500 calories per day. This wouldn't match our daily energy burn, but it would keep our bodies roughly in condition and weight loss gradual and under control. Our key day food was flapjack. See my video on these glorious lumps of syrupy wonderment, plus some chocolate and some peanuts. Morning and evening we rehydrated packet meals and added butter. And my god we needed those calories. Every one. A single loose crumb dropped on the snow had to be picked up and devoured. The early days meant steep slopes rising up onto the plateau, full near 200 kilo sledges, and a bumpy surface. The bumps and waves, called sastrugi, are caused by the wind, and although they can form maddening barriers to progress, the wind does an important job. It disrupts newly fallen snow that would otherwise build into deep powder, a sledger's nightmare. Give me hard bumps over soft powder any day. 
Even with this wind scoured surface, we still broke a trail, and so for our daily sessions, we took turns both out front and following along behind in the tracks. The coast had long since disappeared to our rear, and we saw nothing but flat polar plateau in all directions. Sledging and tent routines continued each day through good and bad weather. I'm more energetic in evenings than mornings, so tended to be slow at waking and breakfast time. That is officially the worst moment of the day. As you can see. It was the portion of the expedition when we really needed to knuckle down and build the miles. The viability of the journey depended on progress early on. If we couldn't get past those four or five mile days and start laying depots for ourselves, we'd never reach the west. The weather in late winter and spring is unpredictable. Temperatures, winds and cloud cover fluctuated from day to day and sometimes hour to hour. We'd not get minus 40 degree temperatures, but they regularly sat in the low minus 20s and high minus 30s. With wind added, this naturally meant serious face protection and ensuring we didn't make any silly mistakes. I had a close call with the cold one evening. Having rushed into the tent when I realised two fingers had lost sensation, I rewarmed them, but two proceeded to peel and become hypersensitive over the subsequent week as they reawakened. An excruciating reminder of my mistake every time I touched something and a shot across the bow. No lasting harm done though. Here's a bit of a video of uh, tent life. Got the, uh, the fuel in the snow pile over there. Uh, the fuel obviously being kept away from the snow pile. Um, the stove with something uh, drying on top of it. Yeah, George has got a few uh, funny marks on his cheeks, which we're not really sure what they are. Bit grip. But, uh, I think we'll have to uh, have an investigation into that. And uh, here's me. <laughs> we enjoyed tent life, even on the coldest days. Equipment was holding up well, including our precious stoves that burn naphtha or white gas. Lack of shelter, huge lumps of cold air wanting to flow downwards from altitude, and many other factors of course make Greenland a windy place. Storms there aren't all conventionally weather-driven, and so can be hard to forecast. Increasingly violent windstorms, despite blue sunny skies above, took some getting used to. Only one day ended up being a complete wipeout with the wind. We made forward progress on every single other day. We needed to. No skiing meant no food, which is no fun. On that one day stuck tent bound, we had a game of enhancing a small part of flapjack with butter. Little did we know that skill would prove useful much later on. The second half of the outward leg of the long haul was the toughest. Temperatures dipped low as we crested the highest part of the ice sheet, at more than two miles thick. The storm seemed to come thick and fast, and in between came heavy snowfall and incessant whiteout. The latter is caused by heavy cloud cover, meaning that in essence you see nothing aside from yourself and each other. It was easy to fall off snow ridges that you simply couldn't see. Also, we could no longer navigate using our bodies as sundials. We endured many weeks of whiteout, which of course impacts straight navigation, and most of them in this phase of the journey. Our only relief was that every 100 miles or so, we could offload four or five kilos of supplies each into a depot. Thereafter, building the largest pyramid of snow we could manage, and a hopeful GPS coordinate. We hauled on, and on, and on. 400 miles, 500 miles, 600 miles, we now regularly managed over 10 miles per day, which was necessary. Of course, our average by the time we finished needed to be in the mid-teens, and we had a lot of ground to make up. So this is the end of a pretty difficult day on the ice cap, as George is doing his uh, diary. This is my knackered uh, face. <laughs> that's his knackered face, yeah. So uh, today was very, very hard. We had lots and lots of sastrugi, and uh, you can see it outside, actually. Uh, it's about minus 15 outside right now and the sun is still up, it's going to be setting about half past nine tonight. 
Um, the Sastrugi got kind of a little bit better during the day, but then deteriorated quite badly. Um, and a huge, great uh, snow dunes, which were about two feet thick in places. So uh, pretty tricky stuff. For electrical power, we had a small folding solar panel whose performance was average at best. GPS and the satellite phone took charging priority, then cameras. Finally, little MP3 players. These were a godsend on the long, featureless days, but I tried to ration myself so as not to become too reliant for my morale. Then the windy days returned with a vengeance. But we were now sledging very gradually downhill. Even though hard to perceive, we had gravity on our side, and as a result, the wind's often on our back and not in our faces. This was an overdue treat. The long, blustery days in harness became less of an ordeal. Although once camped, a wind is a wind. Usually we'd build a snow wall for some protection, but if we knew that the wind was dying down, or if it was forecast to change angle, or if we were just too exhausted, we positioned ourselves for aerodynamic flow and just got on with our evening routine. Our poor tent didn't always thank us for that. After some ill-fated attempts to abandon sledges and move to rucksacks to make a dash for the coast, day 70 arrived. Early that morning, on the first sledging session, we spotted something on the horizon, the first speck of anything really, for months that wasn't just yet more ice and snow. As the day unfolded, the mountainous coastline revealed itself. What we've been waiting for is a bit of the west coast. Uh, and ahead of us now is where we're about to travel and drop off, off the uh, ice cap. In fact, we're actually already off the ice cap at the moment. We have uh, uh, fallen in a couple of snow holes and missed a couple of rafts and things. But that's all cool. Next to me here, there's my, my mate Alex. <laughs> and we are just about to go and make our attempt at the west coast. We were concerned about crevasses on such an unknown and untravelled region of ice, so we did rope up, but the slots all around were just that. It was a comparatively gentle icefall with large exposed sections of ice. Our target was rock. Once we'd touched solid land, we could be happy to have crossed the ice sheet, a feat no one could possibly deride as arbitrary. There's Alex, surveying the scene. And there's a view looking north. Uh, just coming to the picture now will be the uh, the west coast and also uh, a melt pool. This uh, is something you want to avoid at all costs purely because the area around it will be uh, very slushy, very deep, and there is more uh, of our mountains down to our south. Behind us here, you can see the glacier we're coming down with pretty steep, pretty nasty. Um, been a couple of slots we have put down, this knee down, there have been lateral and longitudinal uh, crevasses left, right and centre. We're doing our best to rope it up. Uh, it's pretty spectacular to be standing here, obviously we've been looking at ice, nothing but ice, nothing but whiteness for two and a half months now, two months now, and uh, just having something to look at is pretty cool. So we're both standing here pretty flabbergasted having eaten a, having eaten a banana, uh, banana flapjack, which was, I hasten to add, delicious. This is us moving back, uh, back at the glacier on the west coast, having uh, reached our furthest point away. And uh, up ahead there is Alex, just moving along the crevasse, back up at retracing our steps for the first time in a long time. It's a great feeling. And so to turn around and do it all again. This time we had our depots laid out in front of us in a roughly straight line, spread about three or four days apart and the world record was to fight for. This was going to be a case of threading together our supply depots and hoping they survived. Instead of navigating each day towards a distant coast, we'd instead be looking only three or four days ahead. With light sledges containing just our day-to-day -day and emergency equipment, pace was now everything, bringing the daily average mileages well into the mid-teens. We had to, or we'd run out and fail. The polar high pressure of late spring and early summer could be kind in some senses, fewer storms, less whiteout, and instead of extremely cold, merely cold conditions. If that pendulum goes too far though, problems arise. The persistent Arctic sun can, and does, melt the surface, especially on the lower coastal slopes. If unlucky, you may have to deal with full-blown raging torrents of water, a reality few would predict atop a polar ice sheet. Snow approaching a thaw temperature becomes sticky and slow. But we pushed on. The first depot was diminished, far from six foot high still, but it was there. Again? The uh, GPS was correct to within three feet. That's pretty good, three feet. Others were too. 
even on a now rarer cloudy day, those critical GPS coordinates were still proving faithful. Wildlife, unsurprisingly, had proven absent, save for a lost seabird and a lost goose. On day 89, Rodney, one of my skis, snapped. After a bit of fiddling with strapping technique, we managed to complete surgery we'd hoped would survive another 400 miles. Rodney did end up being a foot shorter than his brother's ski, Delboy. The next day we crossed the thousand mile barrier. Only a handful of people have achieved this, without resupply and human powered. My diary noted that it passed so quietly. I suppose it's in the nature of arbitrary milestones of that sort. They only matter in our minds, an accident in the way that we've decided to count and organise numbers. Oddly, my diary failed to make any such declaration on day 96, save for a mention about being nervous about future depots, and optimistically not long to go. But what declaration? That day, we took control of the polar unsupported distance record, bringing us to 1,087 miles by day's end. No one had skied further than us, without help, in all of history. This was my true goal, and every mile now added a cushion, and would get us home. Yet more ice, depots still being found in reasonable condition, and once again onto a gradual, imperceptible slope towards this time the east coast, the spot where we had begun all those months before. The daytime temperatures were ruining our progress, so we changed to nights. 24-hour sunlight ended as we came south, and it was bliss. Once again our skis and sledges glided on cold snow, but we had dug up the last depot we had proved able to locate. This is our 250 mile depot cairn, looking in pretty good nick actually. This cairn stands on top of a hill we named Doofus Hill, because it's a bloody big one, and we just come up here. Both the penultimate and final buried caches of supplies had shifted along with the ice cap. GPS positions useless and no cairns left. Yes, yes, we should have left bamboo or carbon cane stuck in the snow, Captain Hindsight. We did try probing with a tent pole, but failing that it would be unfeasible to excavate a huge area to a depth of two or three feet. Despite being assured, or perhaps tempted, that we were now only just within helicopter rescue range, onwards we decided to go. I was damned if we were going to get plucked off the ice after over a hundred days. Our weight loss had been controlled to date, but now we were dealing with long days, aiming for 20 miles in each push, and now we did so on practically no food. Weak and dizzy. Onwards. Then a dump of thick, treacly snow, and that was all we needed. Luckily, it crossed it over the next day and we could regain pace once again. The sloping plateau was one thing, but soon it would be time for a more technical descent, route finding and dealing with crevasses. The early summer had left them wide open, not the slightly safer snowed in versions from months before. Down we went, checking on each other and focusing singularly on getting to the end. When and how was near immaterial, assuming we could physically keep going. So this is the view we're blessed with at the end of our expedition, we're about three hours from ending. And there's Goethe's and Matilda. And after 113 days, we reached the edge of the ice. Our return journey was complete. Since the slope was too steep for a helicopter to touch down, we had to retrace our steps for a while, but having marked out a landing spot with black bags and transmitted a final satellite phone message with our location, we sat and waited in surreal disbelief. These were our final moments. We launched the green flare as the heli seemed to veer off in the wrong direction, and then in it came. We were quite pleased.
The following minutes, hours and indeed days were something of a blur. A transformed landscape, other kind human beings to help us in our frail state, human-made objects, civilization, and food. Not that I could hold down more than a few mouthfuls before being repeatedly ill. Even in the airport we had passed through those four months before seemed bewildering. Back to normal would take time. The long haul was over, and it set my life on an unconventional path. Our unsupported polar distance record has since been downgraded to the longest unsupported Arctic journey instead, after an excellent Norwegian trip in the Antarctic. But that's okay, he's a nice guy. From my perspective, I suppose, discussions with media soon after our return speak for themselves. They now hold the record for the longest unsupported polar expedition in history. You just can't quite believe it until the pilot lands next to you, gets out, have a quick handshake, and you just think, this is actually it, it's actually the end. With no support team, the pair skied the equivalent of travelling from here to Scotland and back again, across some of the toughest terrain in the most extreme conditions. Alex is now back home in Portsmouth. It was the real length of the expedition that was the real that was the real killer, though, because um, obviously 113 days, which is how long the expedition took, uh, it's keeping yourself occupied mentally. It's very, very hard. And also in the early stages, trying to keep yourself motivated to keep on going. Alex and George skied 1,374 miles from Kulasuk to the west coast and back again in 113 days. The food we look forward to so much every evening, so it's all you think about, food becomes the obsession. Um, but in terms of nutritional content, perhaps in the future I've taken more protein. Uh, I think our protein levels were a little bit low and that means that we lost a fair amount of muscle. And the majority of the 18 kilograms, nearly three stone, which I lost, uh, was actually muscle rather than, rather than fat. Despite their huge achievement, Alex is keen to play down his record-breaking title. I don't like to see it as a, as a, as a sort of a world record. I just see it as um, just a, a nice, a nice long trip. Catherine Hull in Portsmouth for Meridian tonight. And Alex Hibbert from Portsmouth has just come back from a polar expedition in Greenland, where he faced temperatures of minus 34 Celsius. He managed to get into the record books, which we're delighted about, and he's here with me now. Alex, nice to see you. I guess that's minus 34 Celsius without the wind chill. That's right, yeah, we had some pretty big winds whilst we were out there. So, um, yeah, with, with the wind chill, it got very, very cold. So uh, what sort of temperatures would you get down to? Um, with the wind chill down in the minus 50s, minus 60s. <gasps> yeah. That is cold, isn't it? Now, why did you do this? Well, first of all, we were raising money for charity, which is, uh, I think we've gone well over 15,000 pounds already. Uh, and secondly, um, well, quite clear, just ambition I guess. I wanted to ski further than anyone has else had done before without support. And you did this with who? Uh, with a guy called George Bullard who I actually uh, met a while back and uh, so we've been preparing for the expedition together and uh, we got on very very well actually. So it was and, great and the to, important yeah. thing for this for you was the fact that it was unsupported. That's right. Now what does that exactly does that mean well, in terms means, of adventures? It means two things really. First of all you get no resupplies so you don't get aircraft coming in and giving you extra food. So you have to haul everything behind you which makes the sledges very heavy. Um, and secondly, you're not allowed any kind of power support, so no kites, no dogs to help you along. Right. So you literally pull it. I mean, as we see the pictures here, that's you, isn't it? I mean, just pulling the sledge. It's pure you and there. simple. It's very, very pure travel. So yeah. you didn't take much with you. Now, uh, in front of you there, that is typical of your food, is it? That's dinner. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, all, all you added to that is some some pure fat and some water, and uh, that pure was dinner. Fat. Yeah. Now this is interesting. The story behind what you did with the food, because you're a bit like squirrels, weren't you? That's Burying right. food. Well, very, very few expeditions do return journeys. Most of them get picked up from sort of point B, whereas we were coming back to point A again, so we laid depots all along the way. Uh, and unfortunately on the way back, our final two depots we couldn't actually find uh, because they'd been destroyed by uh, bad storms. And so we had to do the last 10 days on uh, skeleton rations. So you just, literally through GPS, you find the food again, do you? Uh, we actually built a big cairn, uh, which you right. hope there's some of it left by the end of it. <laughs> and then you take GPS coordinates to get you to the rough area, yeah. 
Any sort of dangers that you were facing? Anything yeah. wrong? Well, on the, on the two, on the two uh, coasts, we had a, a polar bear population, which we had to be careful about. Uh, right. And there were very, very heavily crevassed uh, glaciers, which had actually not been travelled uh, recently at all on both coasts as well. Uh, and my ski broke after 1,000 miles, which wasn't very helpful. What did you do? You didn't have a spare pair? Uh, we didn't have a spare pair, no. Um, I mean, the, the weight restrictions mean that spares are very, very limited. So we had to kind of just strap it back together again. Uh, which meant that skiing was quite tough. You joined the Royal Marines when? Uh, five weeks' time. Five weeks' time, right. but your ambition is to do what? Uh, my ambition, well, there's, there's plenty more polar trips to be done, um, yeah. plenty more bigger ones, uh, down in the Antarctic especially. So. Um, well, wish, I wish you luck. Thank and you very congratulations much. getting into the record books. Well done. Great, Alex thank Hibbert, thank you so much for coming in and sharing that with us. It's a great yeah. adventure. More to come, I should think. Some of the gear I've held on to. So what I thought I would do is go down to my storage area and show you some of the, let's see if I can remember my code, I can. Um, what I will do is I'll show you some of the gear and the equipment that's actually left over from the long haul that survived to this day. Sledges I use these days are very different, made from more advanced, lighter and of course more expensive composites, often designed for sea ice and not a more forgiving ice sheet plateau. I'm not going to be using this sledge again on an expedition because it's made of glass fibre and it's just too dense, too heavy to use on a, on a modern day expedition. This is all I could afford at the time, but it did us very well and I've decided to keep it for, for all time's sake. I remain staggered at how fresh my glass fibre sledge looks. Only the stickers have been gently rubbed back and faded. The only shallow marks from being sat on rocks at the end. But it can relax in retirement having done its job. I think I can also find, where are they? Not those, not those. Yep. <laughs> these are the original poles that I used. And again, they are not what I would use these days. Um, <laughs> these are um, the telescopic ones. Oh, I would say they work absolutely fine. That's not the telescopic bit I've got to push. You can tell I've not used these for a while. Um, oh, here we are. Oh, oh, it, it, they are now they are now broken. So they're now very, very much on the uh, on the heap of memories rather than actually usable. <laughs> but yeah, these managed, and they absolutely straight as you like. Whereas I've actually got some other ones I've bent in the meantime, so these did very well. I'd never used these relatively heavy telescopic metal ski poles these days, but they managed the trip. <laughs> Perhaps better than they've survived storage, in fact. I can't find my trousers, I think I binned them in the end, but here's my sun bleached smock, smelling okay again after a series of intensive machine washing cycles. I wore it nearly permanently for nigh on four months. We weren't heavily sponsored, so only a few logos and nods to supporters. If I look even further, I should be able to find Rodney. Uh, here. Haha. <laughs> and still, with all of the gaffer tape still on it that we put on because we were getting um, our skins all balled up with, with uh, wet snow and that was the only solution we had at the time. I hadn't learned about uh, glob stop or wax yet and um, still strapped together in exactly the same way. Finally, my diary. Hardly a charming leather bound journal, but every gram mattered. My handwriting is shocking at the best of times, something of an involuntary encryption technique, but even I can sometimes struggle to decipher the markings. But without this, I'd have never managed to pull together all the ups and downs of the weeks that in low resolution were a monotonous slog, but were punctuated with hundreds of meaningful moments. And so, I owe my first book to this diary. My memory, especially in the hazy, hyperglycemic, starved final days, would not have sufficed. What a perfect segue to a shameless book promotion. The first edition is now only available in second-hand bookstores, but that's okay as the newer edition is much better and is the one that you must now buy. I hope you enjoy it. I'll leave you with some of the other TV news segments that had me laughing so hard while scanning through folders of videos, I nearly injured my diaphragm. Well, it's been a challenge I've been looking forward to undertaking for many years now. Um, from when I was 16 years old, I've had the dream, and it's now that uh, it's becoming reality. Um, got the team um, by man hauling um, solely. Um, so no, um, no resupplies, no kites, no external power source at all. It's simply us hauling the sledges the entire way. Um, we'll be measuring um, our weight um, and a number of other um, uh, variables which are going to be very, very useful to case. 
Well, Alex and Richard, thanks very much indeed. Uh, good luck. I'm sure we'll be talking to you again. The bit I like best is um, we understand that you're estimated to lose 8,500 calories a day doing this. That's right. Sounds yeah. excellent. Um, <laughs> no, 8,500 calories a day? <laughs> Maybe not. 70 minute where yeah. you're on, it's not kind of just downhill and you're. No, no it's, actually, it's actually uphill. We're actually going to be gaining 11,000 feet on the way to the oh poles. Mm -hmm. Which include these incredible boots. Now, Alex's feet are size 11, but the reason why these are so huge is inside are 18 layers of insulation and protection to make sure he stays warm. And all that equipment will be carried on a sledge, which Alex will have to haul behind him. Now, that will weigh around 160 kilograms, which is two of him. Well, when I was a, a young child, I read the, the stories of Scott and Shackleton, and I wanted to do something new. Hi, Alex. How old are you, by the way? Oh, I'm 21 years old. Jolly good. Good God. Bye.